So the Harvard Radcliffe Orchestra is America's oldest symphony orchestra and is currently in its 213th season under the musical direction of Maestro Federico Cortese. Atro's repertoire ranges from classical masterpieces to emerging contemporary pieces. In a normal year, the 80-person orchestra performs four major concerts in Sanders Theater and holds the annual James Yanatos Concerto Competition. We've also toured various places throughout our history, including South Korea, Brazil, Canada, Cuba, and most recently, Argentina. So for today's masterclass, I'm incredibly excited to introduce our guest artist, Jasmine Choi. Austrian-based Korean flutist Jasmine Choi has performed across the globe in a variety of genres from classical solo, chamber, and orchestral to experimental jazz and pop. She holds a bachelor's of music from the Curtis Institute of Music and a master's of music from Juilliard. Selected as one of the best flutists in the history of music by Symphony Magazine UK in 2015, Ms. Choi is a full-time soloist, giving almost 90 concerts each season. Before her full-time career as a soloist, Ms. Choi was also principal flute in the Vienna Symphony Orchestra. She has also recorded several solos, solo CDs under the Sony classical label and has played um, and was featured in the 2018 Winter Olympic celebrations in Pyeongchang, Korea. So today we will have three student performers from the Harvard Radcliffe Orchestra, Elizabeth Lee, Joanna Lau, and our very own president, Jenny Wang. Um, before we start, uh, we are going to start off with a quick Q&A, and I'm also going to ask our performers to give a quick introduction of themselves and the piece that they're playing. Um, so we got a lot of audience questions from the sign-up sheet, and um, Ms. Choi, would you like me to just ask a couple of them at once or just one at a time? Uh, one at a time is good, but how many pre-questions do we have so that, you know, I don't talk too short or too long, you know, but thank yeah. you so much, by the way, for the introduction. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I wanted to wave at you guys before, and I almost broke the vase next to me. <laughs> I was like, no, okay, too much excitement. Okay, so I'll calm down a little bit. So, yeah, so um, how many questions do we have for, for the whole class? Yeah, um, no problem. So there were a lot of questions, actually, but I kind of picked okay. out. Uh, see. I have an but... idea. What about uh, in the beginning, before the performers, uh, we do your pre-selected questions. And then after the performers, uh, we can do live Q&A. You know, you can raise your hand or chat. Yeah. Yeah, that works. Oh. Um, we do have a lot of pre-selected questions, so we could start off with like five, maybe. That might fit into the time better. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So our first question is, um, how has quarantine affected your practice routine? Ooh, um, that's a good question. Um, this is my seventh quarantine uh, across all the different countries. But this one being in Korea, uh, I get to do in my own room. My parents still kept my room here. So it's, um, it's not too bad, I would say, because you feel like home. And in terms of the practice, you know, the quarantine has been since last March. And um, for my schedules before the quarantine, actually, when I... Um, not on a tour. It was more or less similar, I would say. Of course, I, I could go out and all meet and meet friends and so on. But um, for me, I didn't have any nine to five jobs or schools. So um, it wasn't too much of a difference. But um, in terms of practicing, I try to plan my day ahead. When I wake up, I know what's what's coming up for the day and also leave for the surprises. You know, sometimes life happens, you have to do other things. So it's great that also I can be flexible enough because I have obviously more time uh, with less concerts and less traveling time and so on. So it's been quite okay. And as long as I am healthy and we're healthy, um, I think it's, yeah, it's a really you know, blessing for that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next question is, being a solo flautist, is there anything that you miss about playing in an orchestra? 
Oh yeah, everything. Um, I, I miss my colleagues and I may, miss making great orchestral music, symphonies and in all the large scales and also uh, chamber music. But the thing is, I still do it. I'm not a full time. It was like um, my schedule has been flipped to the other way that when I was doing the full time orchestra, uh, I was doing also solo concerts uh, on the side, but of course I did more of the orchestra concerts and now it's flipped. I do mostly the solo concerts and uh, for the orchestral performances, performances I do as a guest principal here and there. And when they ask for me, I decide whether I do it or not. Or <clears throat> every summer, I play at Lincoln Center's mostly Mozart uh, festival. So that's like four concerts a week, five weeks in a row. So that's like an orchestra intensive, you know? <laughs> so that's that and chamber music, I do a lot as well on the side. So I would say it's more or less well balanced. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good to hear that you still get both experiences. <laughs> So our next question was a very popular one. Um, it's basically how do you prepare on the day of a concert and how do you cope with stress before a performance? I see. When you say it, it's a popular one, I, I thought you were going to ask how many hours do you practice? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the most popular one. Uh, day of the concert. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, I think um, I don't I don't do anything particular, but, but all the usual things that all the performers do as well. Like I try to sleep enough and um, try not to overly exhaust myself. And the thing is, you know, on the day of the concert, I'm so focused on the concert itself that I, I tend to forget everything else, like bringing stuff you know, like concert dress, concert shoes, or, you know, um, to eat before the concert. And then it's like all, all of a sudden, half an hour before the concert, I realize I'm hungry, you know, you know, all that kind of panic. Um, so after <laughs> a few times of big dramas, I try to <laughs> write down, this is too stupid that I forget this stuff but I try to write down don't forget to eat you know don't don't forget to pick up your lunch or dinner and you know bring chocolates or you know anything um yeah but before the concert I, I don't think I do anything particular like uh certain other musicians <laughs> yeah I see um so our next question is, do you have any advice for late starters? Um, so for someone starting flu in like their 20s or 30s? Um, you know, these days, especially, it's more and more often this way, uh, that when you start an instrument, um, I think people tend to look ahead too far, you know? I think learning the instrument should be considered like having fun, most of all, you know, not to become somebody, not to get to a certain level. It's like when you start a PlayStation a game, something, um, you don't look for, you know, all the way to the end. Do you think I can make it to the end? Do you think I started too late because you started this game last year? You know, I don't think it's like that. Everyone has their different paces and for especially music and sports, um, the main focus should be how much you enjoy. And from the moment you don't enjoy, I don't see a point why you're doing it, you know? Don't make you suffer. Um, don't make yourself suffer uh, with the music of all things, you know? Music should be there to, to be enjoyed. And yeah, and once you start, uh, I would say you should put all your heart into it and put all your effort into it yeah yeah thank you for your insight um it's very inspirational um so we're kind of nearing the 15 minute mark so i think okay. 
we'll continue the Q&A session at the end and perhaps, okay. yeah, perhaps start with our first performer of the day, who mm -hmm. is Lee. Right. Awesome. Um, hi, Ms. Choi. <laughs> it's so nice to meet you through the Zoom. Hi, where are you? Uh, I don't see you. <laughs> there are too many people. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi, hi. <laughs> I'm at home in Ann Arbor, Michigan right now, um, and I am a first year flutist at the college. Um, when I was in Ann Arbor, I studied with Jamie Wagner. I don't know if you know who she is, um, but I also was involved in like DSO related things. So I studied a bit. With what related things? Um, DSO, like the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. So yeah, that was my high school food experience and I'm very excited to be playing. Um, so yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> so you are a freshman now. That means you haven't gone to the actual school yet because of the COVID? Yeah, I, I mean, I was- You haven't left home? <laughs> <laughs> I left home for a semester. <laughs> um, but because freshmen technically weren't invited back second semester, I decided to stay home. I see. Yeah. Great. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll be playing Bones Grand Polonaise. Probably just okay. the first four pages because of time. But Okay. Yeah, looking forward. I'll mute myself for now.
all that. I promise. Bravo! Yay! Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful playing. Um, how do you find practice time during all your crazy coursework? You know, I think uh, I read your bio that you're even double majored, you know? Is it? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not like technically a double major. I think with applied math, you can find the focus area. So it's, it's like not really, <laughs> but... I can't even breathe thinking about it, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> that's really amazing. Yeah, because it, it takes um, a lot of physical hours to even learn all the notes, you know. For sure, yeah. I mean, maybe I'm talking about myself. <laughs> it takes Definitely. many hours, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, first of all, um, I don't know how many flutists are watching or how many non-flutists are watching. So those of you who don't know about this composer, Theobald Böhm, he's a German composer, inventor, conductor um, uh, from Munich. And he's uh, one of the most important figure in the flute history. Um, so he not only was a virtuoso flutist himself, he was a composer, left so many amazing flute works like this one. This one is the most well-known work. And also uh, what you guys see, all the flutes these days, it's a creation invention from Mr. Burm. So before this metal flute, when we had the wooden flute we had holes in it and with the holes we can only close one hole at a time but with this key brim system you know sometimes we press one key and there are other you know you see there are other keys coming down together and so on and all these combinations so he invented all the different um, modern fingerings and so on so that's that um, in the very beginning in the first page in the introduction. It was very beautiful and I love that you take time here and there, but 
there's always a but. <laughs> you know, once you start in the middle part, um, I think it's this one. Uh, let me turn down the volume a little bit. Um, so here. No. That's what piano is playing, the triplets. So whatever you do, uh, you shouldn't make the pianist wait for you or go with you, you know? Um, make sure you are always imagining the pianist playing the same triplets, um, not like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, you know? So whatever you do, always imagine there is a border you cannot cross, you know? It applies to every piece that uh, there is a certain border that we cannot cross, you know? And of course, um, modern, uh, not modern, <laughs> romantic era, the border is of course much larger, but still there is a border you cannot cross. So um, let me hear that part uh, right there. Dun, da, da. Oh, maybe I always too soft. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's better. And always the trick is to find the balance. You know, if we, in our head, if we think about being so strict, the music is so strict as well. And then when we think about, think about we have to be free and then it's too much to the other way. So I think performing well means, you know, really trying to find the golden balance so let me hear once again, um, try to fit in this triplets, but still give us the feeling that you're really free and having fun. One, two, three, one, two, three, you know? Yeah, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Uh, let's go on from there. Um, Elizabeth, I don't have the score with me, but I would like to know where the retardando begins, right in the last phrase you played. Um, there is no written retardando. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, surprise! <laughs> <laughs> so yeah because I would I'm, I'm used to play that much faster and I thought maybe there is a retardando you know you tested me you know <laughs> so let me see um how does it go uh what's the last phrase go um it's like the the or the notes from high G to like C sharp and then. I see. Yeah. So when you
when you look at this quartz, bum, ba da da dum, ba da da dum, ba da da digga 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 dum. Oh, but I think I heard the da 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 da. Yeah, it's actually twice as fast, twice as faster. So try that. Yeah, that's the rhythm. Yeah, so keep that. Awesome. Let's move on to the Polonaise, okay? Okay, uh, let me stop you there. So can you talk to all your friends um, what Polonaise is? Um, it's like a dance of sorts, right? Yeah, and how does it go? I'm not sure. <laughs> Did you just say what I just heard? <laughs> Wait, hold on. I'm trying to find out the original, turn on the original sound, but I cannot find it. I guess you guys can hear me okay, right? Okay, so, <laughs> so you let me tell the people what Polonaise is. So the Polonaise is the specific kind of rhythm. It's a dance rhythm. It's in three, but it's a special kind of rhythm. It has bum, thrum, bum, 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 thrum, bum, bum, bum. And for the flute repertoire, we don't actually have that many of Polonaise pieces. But if you look at um, orchestra, symphonic music, um, you could find it a lot. And Tchaikovsky wrote a lot, and a lot of Polish composers wrote a lot. Like Chopin wrote so tons of Polonaises for um, piano solos and so on. And the notes are changing, but the rhythm stays the same. It's lum, thrum, bum, bum, thrum, thrum, bum, bum, bum. So imagine this rhythm. It's um, it relates to what we were talking about in the page before, um, fitting into the piano's triplets. And now you have to imagine. I mean, if you play with the piano, it is it is there, <laughs> bum, thrum, bum, bum, bum. But you have to groove with it not just playing the flute part, what's written, correct rhythm. It makes a whole difference if you play the rhythm or if you play and the, feel the rhythm. So, um, let me hear just in the beginning of the phrase, uh, Polonaise. Yeah, it's more bouncy now to my ears. And you're getting there and I'm just being picky. And let's let's look at the longer notes when you have and 
and then the next phrase, dum, bum, bum, the G's. And these longer notes are looking, you know, in comparison to all the other so many notes you have, it, it feels like it's nothing, it's easier. And oh, some, you know, finally it's my moment, I can have some rest. But you have to really make sure it's still vibrating, still alive, still beautiful. So there's a difference uh, when you play here. What? And then you know the note is singing and you have to make it breathe by itself. And then the next phrase. Instead of here as well. So play play this play the same thing and now focus on the longer notes, okay? much better and now um now i'm losing the pulse <laughs> so so let's move on from where you just stopped and combine all that together it's a lot to remember at once but try it <laughs> you could or you don't have to <laughs> i always have something to say when you stop um let's see when you when you have something like this figure the slurs over the beads You know, some something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I want it to sound perkier. Uh, how are we gonna do that? You know, I'll show you. I'll show you a difference. So, one is what I heard was. <laughs> it's a little heavier, and the other way is. So, what was the difference? Um, you shortened the end of the slurs. Um, yeah, yeah. Can you try that? Yeah. Um, Maybe it was not the exact section you played, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> pick, pick the, yeah, pick the spot where you have that slurs over the beats. Yeah, I can play what you just played. If that would be good. Okay. Yeah, let's put it slower so that you don't have to distort the rhythm. <laughs> you know, um, okay, now it's a masterclass. Okay, it's fine. But when you're at home, it's really okay to practice slower. You know, it's for you guys all <laughs> who are practicing at home. It's really okay to practice a little bit slower and even slower and all the way the slowest 
you know, nobody's watching. It's only you. It's, it's, it's okay. Pick the slowest tempo that it's so slow that you can play everything so perfectly. You know, that's your tempo to begin with. Okay. So yeah, try it, try once. <laughs> Doesn't matter how slow. <laughs> try once. I was missing some notes. Dum, da, da, dum, da. You don't do the turns. Oh. 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 <laughs> but I'll let you work on that after the class. Um, and else. let's move on to the next page. Next, next page. Uh, oh, I'm not on too loud. Sorry. So here. So in these in these two phrases you just played, uh, there are everything we have just talked about. So there there is a piano <laughs> rhythm going on polonaise. And then when you have bottom 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 bottom, it's the same idea. Instead of da 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 da, you can play bottom 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 bottom. So, um, of course, you know, I think we all know that our brain cannot multitask. So, it's actually impossible to think about all the different things when you play. So, what we do, how are we going to do it? Fix one at a time until it becomes your habit, good habit, <laughs> so that it works, you know, without you thinking about it. And then you fix another thing, and then another thing, one at a time. And then in the end, by the time when you're performing for your lesson or concerts, then finally, you can only think about music, the atmosphere, you know, having fun, enjoying, you know. So, yeah, so I, I know I'm asking you too many things at once, you know, <laughs> you fix one thing and then I say, but this one is not fixed, you know, I don't think it's fair. But the point is that you know all these things listed that I just talked about. Um, don't try to fix everything at once. So I would say really slowly think about this rhythm and then try to fit into it and then still next and then you can do uh, how to make it bouncier because it's a dance you know you don't want to dance like boom 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 you know <laughs> so it's all related yeah uh yeah so let's hear that again and Yes, yeah. So it's amazing that all we changed was a thought. And then whew, the whole, whole music is blooming. You know, that's what we should 
aim for. You know, sometimes it's, we're not talking about something so difficult, you know, something too Im- impossible, you know, it's most of the time it's about how we think and we change the concept of certain things. And then the whole thing changes by itself automatically. And um, yeah, um, I think, do we have more time? Because I can always go on. Um, I think we're right at the end of the 30 minute mark. So we could move on to a performer. Okay. Um, Sorry, we couldn't get to every section, but uh, you can write to me and any questions if you have more. So bravo, Elizabeth. Thank you. (laughs) Oh, I like seeing all everybody clapping. It's like a real concert. (laughs) Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, So our next performer is Joanna Lau. Hi, everyone. Hi, I'm Joanna. Um, Yeah, I guess I'll just introduce myself. I'm a sophomore and I'm majoring in neuroscience with a minor in English. And yeah, and I'm going to play the first movement of the Vitor Suite. Okay. Great.
Bravo. Beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. So you're also a freshman, right? I'm a sophomore. Sophomore. So oh, you've actually um, gone through the whole school year before the corona? Almost. I was there for three quarters of the school year. Right. <laughs> so, like March. so, you know, I'm really curious. Um, um, how is it like to major neuroscience at Harvard and practice flute on the side when you have time and and still play so amazingly? Thank you. you know? Yeah, it's it's been fun. I gotta say, I haven't taken too many neuroscience classes yet. I've only taken <laughs> one introductory class. But yeah, I try to squeeze in the flute practice when I can. It's always a nice break. Wow. Yeah, it's so, so wonderful to hear. It's, it's a nice break. Ah! <laughs> Something you can really have fun. With. I think that's, yeah, that's, that's a great point that also um, professional musicians and uh, people who major in music should, we should all think like that. It's, it's a nice break from mm -hmm. doing other things. So let's talk about this piece. Oh, this one, I downloaded this core to share. So let me see how it works. Uh, host disabled screen sharing. Patrick, is it possible for me to share the screen? <laughs> or it's okay. You should be able to no. now. Now it works. Oh, great. So because I think it's always better to have the score. Uh, okay, let's try that. Does it work? Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. So, okay, where's my zoom? Oh, the zoom got smaller. Okay, let's try that. So let's go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the composer and the piece? Because I think most of us don't know about the composer mm -hmm. yeah, too much. Fedor I mean, is French. I personally think this piece is very romantic sounding. <laughs> it's a sweet, it so is. it has like four movements, sort of goes a little bit back and forth with like a slower, more lyrical, and then like a more dance-like movement and then it has a romance which is the third movement again a little bit you know a little slower and then a fast last movement yeah great it is a very very romantic piece from a very very romantic era of a uh, middle of paris <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, i wanted to give you guys who are listening a little bit of information of charles widor um he his he's like for organists he's like the Theobald Burham you just heard mm -hmm. before with Elizabeth he was so into organ he he was from the organ building family <laughs> and he wrote so many unbelievable organ works organ symphonic works and organ solo works and so on and I think I don't know. This is probably the only piece that's known for written for flute and it's dedicated for Paul Tefanel. And imagine this period when Paul Tefanel was living um, at the end of the 18th century. And um, it's even, you know, can you imagine before even 1900 came? And I would say people, I mean, Obviously, I wasn't there, but <laughs> I, I'm so convinced that there were so much more emotional and more um, romantic and sensitive in their hearts than nowadays. And, and I want you to think about that, how to be, like you said, it's a, such a sweet piece. And how to bring, yeah, that's, the question is how to bring that out to the audience, what you have felt, you know, you know, feeling the peace, it's already um, a lot of steps. 
because some performers don't even feel it you know there are many people plays many notes without feeling completely but you i could feel you have it all and now uh you know that's why we practice how to bring what's inside of your interpretation and your thoughts to the audience to the right way you know you feel this much and then you can only bring this much to the audience and we should work on that how to you know make it fully delivered to the audience and think about this period paul tuffanel was was the sensational virtuoso of flutists back then he was the guy when uh, in his lifetime and um think about what other environments that Tafanel and Widor were surrounded with you know what other painters you you can imagine you know composers you know all these um prolific french composers you can name wc ravel you you can associate with this piece you know of course they're, they're different totally different atmospheres colors but imagine and bring yourself to this period and absorb yourself into it mm -hmm. and then start your first note <laughs> yeah so before i get into fixing every single note to just do this and that and faster slower louder softer i want you to feel first all these other things you know what kind of literature was were written back then and you know you can imagine what the movies and so on mm -hmm. and then when you start probably it's a lot different than how you played in the beginning before mm -hmm. so let's hear first few lines again and let us hear something completely different okay i shouldn't say completely but give us more of this kind of atmosphere end of 18th century feeling mm -hmm. <laughs> beautiful wow i <laughs> really didn't want to stop you know i i want i, I wanted to um ask you to play just in the beginning phrases and then it was so beautiful and I'm like oh i hope she gets playing this is so beautiful you know but everything what you play from now on it should be like this you know make them want to listen even more and more oh please don't stop please don't stop you know don't make the listeners to be the other way. Oh, this is boring. Oh, when is it going to end? You know? <laughs> so, 
Oh, this is oh, so beautiful. And so let's work on a little bit of the details. Uh, I found a few of your bad habits and let's try to fix that. Uh, in the process of you try to express the music more. Uh, sometimes I hear a necessary push, a necessary, so to speak, crescendo when it's not supposed to be. And it's not even intentional. You don't even know you're doing it, but it's keep happening. So let's see. Um, in the very beginning, and then, so in the very beginning phrase, it's it's the opening, the curtains opening, yeah. That's when everybody expects, you know, oh, that's a big question mark. What is gonna come next? But then when you actually start the real melodies, don't give us too much too soon, you know? In, a, in other words, do as written. It's piano, mm -hmm. piano, and then a little bit of a color on the A, a flat, and then pianissimo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you take a look at the dynamics and, and all the markings, you know, these composers have actually thought a lot of it, you know? <laughs> so it's actually rewarding, very rewarding to keep everything what's written as it is. And we have to really intentionally keep everything what's written. So uh, here. You know, the note is going up. That doesn't mean you have to always do with the crescendo. Mm -hmm. um, with the nature of flutes and wind instruments in general, we need more air to do uh, higher registers. Um, in other words, we, are, we have to work in this praise, keeping the piano, no crescendo with the going ascending notes. We have to, um, you know, play the other way. Uh, not not the flute's nature, in other words. So don't do. Uh, you know, it's too much excitement too first, too, too, too fast. So And then in the next phrase, don't do the same kind of habit I heard. You know, um, I feel your emotions, but we have to be able to give the same emotion without pushing too much air. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you have to say something to somebody really important um, and you're so emotional and Sometimes it shows everything that we could feel all your emotions pushing down. Oh, she's saying like this, but inside she's got so much, you know, either way, if you're full of anger or full of happiness or full of love, you know, there's a way that you can express everything. It's okay, you know, sometimes when you're full of happiness, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> but let's say, oh yeah, you love somebody so much, this much, but you're, you're gonna say, you know, I'm just, you know, you're beating the bush, <laughs> beating around the bush. So here, And then finally, there's a crescendo. So let's try from the beginning and keep it simple as possible. And don't put too much vibrato yet. Think about Debussy's music, you know, that kind of quality, especially in this oh, first movement. Okay.
Okay, Joanna, uh, it's great. So like I said before, let's fix one at a time. Mm -hmm. So now you know that you'll fix it over the time. And the other, there are two more <laughs> bad habits. <laughs> so number two is your breathing. Uh, whenever you breathe, somehow it's like timeless, tempoless. <laughs> <laughs> So let's keep it tempo. Yeah, uh, just do it from the melody section. Again, again, again. It was still stretched. Uh, again, again. Yeah, um, still it's not quite there yet, but this problem, I would say, <laughs> uh, could be fixed when you practice with metronome really slowly, because with the slow tempo, not, not only it's slower for the fingers, but also it gives more time for you to breathe. It gives you more time um, between the notes. Mm -hmm when it's slower, but then try to keep it in time, breathe on time. It's also very important when you learn the Midsummer Night's Dream, you know, there's so little time and the phrase is forever, you know, and, and when we practice that for the audition, I mean, if you are playing in the orchestra, after you actually win the audition, it's much easier. There's conductor and there's orchestra, members playing with you but when you play this alone and here as well uh, it's so hard to keep it up with the tempo so same method play with the metronome and slowly and then build up um, on time and why is this happening because you're you need more air and you haven't learned yet how to breathe certain amount of air in a quicker time. So why is it happening like that? How are you gonna improve that? I think, yeah, just practicing the joins, right? So, so practicing taking that fast breath up the join. I think right now I had a habit of a little bit of noisy breathing. So I went a little bit in the mm -hmm. other extreme to give it more time so that I'm not gasping. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm glad you're aware of it that, uh, yeah. Um, okay, then I can understand. So you're trying to make the less breathing noise and then that makes you have less amount of the air in a certain time. Mm -hmm. you know, let's fix that. <laughs> so let's think about why it's making a noise when you breathe in. Yeah, usually because of some tension, right? Like because of some tension in the throat, usually. Why the tension makes noise? Because it like closes off the throat a little bit. So then you're like gasping more with a smaller space. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It's like uh, when we when, when we just breathe, like we all do right now. Nobody's breathing like, <gasps> you know. <laughs> but let's see. It makes a lot of noise when you do. <sighs> when there's so little space with so much air. Same thing when we are out of breath after running um, full speed. So 
think about when you when you're yawning you're all opened up mm -hmm. so that's how much you should open when you play the flute mm -hmm. you know that much space wouldn't make any noise that you're making now <gasps> can you can you just try it without the flute Yeah, that's how you should breathe. And not only making more space in your throat and in the full mouth, also you have to open your mouth as, as big as possible. You know, as simple as that. <laughs> but when you're all tensed, for example, in, in, on your armchure, um, it stops you to make your mouth full, fully open. Mm -hmm. So it's all related. You have to be all relaxed and I'm sure as well. And make sure when you're opening the mouth for the breathing, uh, you're only moving the jaw down, yeah. not your head up. Mm -hmm. So everything else stays the same, but only your jaw. <sighs> like that. Yeah. Can you try that without... Playing. Yeah, that's how you should breathe all the time. Mm -hmm. And that'll decrease your, not only the sound of the breathing, but you don't need too much time breathing. Okay, and yeah, um, before <laughs> we're running out of time, there are third habits. There's, there's your third habit, uh, which is your right hand position um i wonder if i can make you bigger does this get bigger okay your, your screen became so small now okay now i'm gonna stop sharing so that i see you larger okay so i know you have the thumb rest it helps but i see something like this oh it it hurts already um i think the best position is here it's like, you know, you, sometimes you don't even have to see because the most comfortable position is when you hold the flute um, just like this and try to balance uh, the flute and try to find out where makes you the most comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could do this and I could play this, but then when the thumb is here, it kind of numbs my three fingers on the uh, right hand. I mean, it doesn't numb, but it's quite uncomfortable and it gets slower. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you know, for the flute repertoire, there's so many fast stuff because throughout the whole history, music history, we were always the birds and <laughs> composers <laughs> thought of, I mean, not even big birds, we were always the little birds. You know, every composer um, expressed the flute, expressed the birds with the flute. So in other words, we have many fast notes and, and you, don't, you don't want another obstacles to play fast notes, more difficult, right? So I would move the thumb here, da, 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 until here. Mm -hmm. That makes the best balance in my taste and yeah mm -hmm. even with or without thumb rest um think about what makes the most comfortable right hand position mm -hmm. and then try to balance it you know like that yeah mm -hmm. and yeah it'll it'll come pretty soon this one <clears throat> i think it's easier to fix than the other two habits yeah um yeah i think that's all three big habits <laughs> and we all have habits and um the thing is when when i was a teenager i started writing down all my bad habits um and then i was getting so scared that the list was getting longer and longer and then it made it to the next page and then the next page, I'm like, oh, my God, you know, what am I going to do? I wanted to check off, you know, everything. You know, this bad habit is gone. This is gone. And I was full of bad habits. It was whole, whole package of bad habits. And then 
what happened was that I could actually never be able to check off any of this one by one. But then, um, you know, years go by, years go by, and then I realized that it's sort of everything sort of there, but then everything is kind of disappearing together at the same time because it's all related. If you fix that, this one gets better as well and so on. But the most important thing is that you are aware of your own bad habits because the fixing is doesn't matter when, it's just a matter of time. Sooner or later, you will fix it. But if you're not aware of it, that's another story. It'll be always there with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, bravo. It was a pleasure listening to you. <laughs> Hey, bravo, Joanna. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Joanna. Um, our final performer of the day is our president, Jenny Wang. President. Oh, yes. Miss President. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, yes, as Yura so nicely said, I'm we're so honored to be president of this amazing organization um even though we can't play right now which is very sad but that's okay it's fine um mm. yes i'm i'm a junior at the college and i'm pursuing a double uh, double major in neuroscience and music and planning for music school at some point hopefully Ooh. Yes. wow and then i love your posters in the back very impressive yes. you know <laughs> yes. welcome, welcome to my room um Normal. Normally, I see a poster of James Galway or you know, Amanda. Um, Maybe it's on the other wall. Yeah, yeah. Um, and my, I'm from Chicago, and so my, so my room at home in Chicago, I literally have, yeah, that. So. Okay. Great. Um, <laughs> okay. Now, now I feel more familiar with you. Yeah, Great. Yeah, so my science mode here. Great. So I have also the PDF of the Prokofiev. So Patrick, let me share that. Prokofiev. Um, uh-huh. 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 Um, would you like to do that after she performed her piece or? Yeah, maybe it's better. Yeah, good idea. So that we're not checking every note on you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll mute myself now.
Bravo. That was amazing. Wow. Yeah. Um, so we all know the Prokofiev, I, I, I hope. <laughs> so would you like to share a little bit about the piece to the people who are listening? Yeah, so the Prokofiev Sonata um, was written in, I think, 1943 by Prokofiev. Um, and it's four movements, so that was the last movement, which is my favorite one, because it goes very fast. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, and Prokofiev's Russian, he's a Russian composer, and so this was written like during the time of World War II, and so there's a lot of turmoil in his life because of that. Um, I feel like that is the end of my knowledge. That, I can <laughs> that, that was great that was great so yeah so this was clearly written during the turbulent time and it was a yeah really confusing time uh, um as opposed to what we heard in the last two pieces i mean i'm sure every life every period had their own crisis but in comparison this was a um, very unsettling period and um, for that, I wanted to ask you more to bring out this kind of um, nervous, uncomfortable, kind of sometimes nasty feeling. Um, it was more um, too comfortable in my taste. <laughs> and whatever you're feeling and what... All these knowledge you have, you should bring more. You should express more, you know, so that it doesn't sound like you're sitting in a in a rocking chair, you know, like you know, comfortable. But it should be more like you're at the end of the chair. I'm like, oh my god, what, what's what's going to come? I have sweaty hands, you know. Oh, it's so nervous. Oh my god, is is it going to explode? Explode? Oh my god, it's just explode. <laughs> and things like that. Um, and this is, Prokofiev is so well known to us, but on the other hand, it's surprisingly very recent composer. Mm, I still remember this shock when I was uh, at Curtis. I was obviously a teenager and learning with Julius Baker, the legend, and he was 80 plus years old. He was born in 1915. And I brought this piece to him and he said, you know, I've met Prokofiev myself and we were working together. I'm like, what? <laughs> it was, yeah, very unreal. And and then I realized Prokofiev is very recent, much more, more recent than I realized. I, you know, before then it was only the numbers, you know? Okay, he was born in this year and died in that year, but um, and if we can connect in this way, it shines in a different way. So um, let's play again the beginning and, and let me share the screen and go from there. Yeah, oh wait, which page are we? Okay, we're ready. <laughs> So, so Jenny, uh, how are we going to create this urgency and how are you going to show uh, this impatient, you know? Yeah. Um, well, one way I can think of is like within the confines of like the larger beats, feeling like a rushing forward sort of. Um, as far as... Yeah, almost there. Uh, how can we be... 
help creating the the everything you just said, but without the rushing part. Okay. Yes. So not rushing part, but <laughs> forward movement feeling. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. So try that one more time. So mm -hmm. keep the pulse and still create this feeling that you're like, oh, oh my god. You know, it's like kind of the oh, this um, yeah building is like this and I, I, when is it going to fall down you know <laughs> but not <laughs> okay Yeah, it's it's better. It's better. Uh, what have you changed? Um, the parts every time there was like repeated notes, I like thought of them going forward. Um, I like tried to try to emphasize that. Um, yes, and then everything else was sort of feeling like trying to feel like I was sort of staying on my toes and like not. Yeah, trying, yeah, not, like, it was. Yeah, we felt that it was so much better, um, except there's always but um, that we felt like you were pushed, you were rushed by okay. something, you're not in a poised or you are not completely under control of what you're playing. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, thing about Prokofiev that he he started combining this modern music, modernity, and the, also he embraced, he embraced the classical period style, like his classical symphony. And also in the very beginning of this sonata, it's very classical up until it's not. <laughs> and then and until the harmony changes. Um, but in this period, think about how the machines were booming, started to boom. And Prokofiev started to try to emulate them. And um, that's why it helps so much to play something as a lot of times really like a machine. And the hard part for, for playing Prokofiev is like, you're playing like a machine, so exact, but on top of it, you should still make music, not sounding like exactly the machine. So what I heard from you was um, you were a little bit towards to the rushing part than the machinery part. <laughs> and since we don't have too much time, uh, for example, in look at take a look at the quarter notes in the very beginning and the eighth notes, you know, these things should be exactly what it is and not too soon, not too late. And at the same time, when you do the quarter notes, it's not bomb, bomb, bomb. It's not three different quarter notes. You have to connect the notes that you have to create this whole urgency between the notes, not each note. So instead of, oh my God, I'm gonna to be, I'm gonna be too loud. So, so instead of you know, it should be bom, bom, bom. there's a space, but then it should move forward. There's there's a space, not a complacent, but it should be like ah, it's a silence, but we we have this feeling that we're moving forward. Um, so try that again, just in the beginning. Okay, 
yeah the the second attempt was much better the first one was uh you were cutting off yeah and then the second one the second one you were creating the reverb the urgency during the rest and obviously we don't play da 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 you know tenuto you're doing it correctly the rhythm is great but now the question is i'm just being very picky now the question is how you're going to connect during this little space between that notes you know um my other teacher jeffrey kaner he's he told me you know how to interpret the rest it makes a whole difference not only you have when you have the rest but you know things like here when you have some kind of a little bit of a space between the notes and so on so um that's that and let's move on to actually uh, to save time um oh. Oh, right there, right here. Uh, is it 41? 41. Yeah. Oh, uh, you don't have the same music. Oh, no, it is. It is the same. You do? Yeah. Okay, let's play that. So here, um, I want to hear more of the rhythm than you try to be expressive. Okay. So don't be too emotional before you play uh, the, the right rhythms. For example, the 16th note, it's a little bit uh, unsure, a little bit, I would say, wobbly-ish. So here. Um, So as opposed to, yeah, um, it's different what kind of, what, what composers you're playing and which phrase and so on. So um, in this case, I want to hear exact rhythm, not being wobbly by the emotions. And then you can put the musical side on top of that. So um, play the same thing exactly exactly what's written uh, the, the rhythm wise and then we'll put the musical side later okay just try that in the beginning yeah okay much better and then now let's put the atmosphere, correct atmosphere. Um, try to be as heavy as possible. It's not like da 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 da. No, it's really really heavy and it's a big sigh and um, yeah, rather depressing moment. Okay, try try that. Add add that on. <laughs> Yeah, I love that so much better. Yeah, that's the atmosphere I would go for. And one last thing in the same phrase, um, whenever you take a breath, it's, it kind of ruins the mood because you're like cutting off, like uh, the last note is not important, but you have to care the note before you take a breath and make sure it has the same length like the other eighth notes. Don't cut it off. Okay, one last time and we'll move on, okay? Oh, 
but in tempo. Uh, breathe in tempo. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> I love that so much. And even if, just one last thing, <laughs> okay, I lied. <laughs> okay, this is gonna be the real last thing. Um, you can connect so much better between the notes, especially the 16th notes, you know, it's fast enough that we don't think about uh, how to connect, but if you really connect between the notes, even the 16th note, it makes a huge difference here. Um, Instead of it's like um, it's like you're on an escalator. Every note you're going with the escalator, not with the stairs. It's not one note and the other note. You have to connect. You have to go through in between. Yeah, this um, applies to every legato playing you will like encounter um, you know this movement and this whole piece it's uh it's challenging for a flutist i don't know about the violinists but <laughs> it's challenging for the flutist because we need to master the entire flute range possible we have to um blast out in the low notes in the first movement and then also hear what's coming up the you know all these uh, changing registers, we have to be consistent with the sound quality and um, the facility. <laughs> Is that the word? Facil. <laughs> How to play with ease. So um, play that a little bit. Same thing, try to go between the notes, even if it's really fast. You know, um, this is a master class. It's not a big concert, but you know, it doesn't matter if it's a master class or you're playing for a house concert or playing for one friend. You know, when there's a, somebody other than you, you know, treat it like it's a concert. You know, you don't have to be shy about, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so. Be a performer wherever you play. Yeah. So, bravo. Thank you so much, Jenny. <laughs> really amazing. So, um, you're a... Shall we do more questions then? I, I see there are some... Yeah, um, absolutely. In the chat box. Oh. Yeah. yeah a oh. Bit so, Patrick, I've seen your message now. I'm too late. My sound was cutting off. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> I'm two hours too late. Um, yeah. Sorry for all the cutting 
sound. It's okay. It's okay. It didn't happen too often. So. Um, really? Yeah. You should have just cut the, the class and told me. Um, so uh, I didn't see the chat box. Anyway, too late. <laughs> yeah, so a big congrats to all of our performers. Thank you for your beautiful performances. And thank you, Jasmine. Um, thank you, guys. We can go into our live Q&A session um, open to the audience. So under reactions, there should be an option to raise your hand. And if you click on that, we can call on you and you can ask a question. Oh, I just realized there are a lot of you. Yeah, or what you can do is okay. type your question into the chat and I can- Yeah, do don't, don't, don't be shy. Just ask, ask away everything, anything. Okay, there's a chat. Box question. Do you have any tips for practicing vibrato? Uh, yeah, Ooh, somehow we didn't get to the vibrato today. Um, yeah, the, the common bad habit of the flute vibrato is that first, it's, it's either too fast or too sharp, not pitch wise, but the shape wise. So let's say, okay, <laughs> adjust the volume. So. You know, this kind of choppy vibrato, so-called. So what we should aim for is to make a rounder vibrato, not the choppy, sharp vibrato. Um, and the other common issue is that a lot of flutists, when we do the vibrato, it's either we do it or not. Either it's there or not there. But try to think of the vibrato as your part of expression. It's not like a vibraphone. You know vibraphone, it's like a marimba, but you plug into the electricity and, and then when you turn it on, it, it's on. And when you turn it off, it's it's off, but it's in the exact same tempo, wah, 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 you know? And since we are not a machine and we're able to do more than that, I think we can, it's okay to explore, explore more. And, and then the next step is to learn how to control the speed of the vibrato, which is surprisingly very difficult. So I would put the metronome marking 60 and try to put different numbers of the circles for each beat. Oh, so start with the easier one, three circles, a beat. Oh, sorry. Four circles. But the point is, don't just do three or four. You have to really make sure it's round enough. Not. And this kind of roundness, you can explore and learn best when you put two circles in one beat because it's harder. <laughs> and try to put one circle in one beat, it's really hard <laughs> because it, it's easier to do a somehow um, crooked circle, not a whole circle. So, but do it anyway. and so on. And then you should be able to master all different speed of the vibrato so that you can use it uh, in different situations. And it, it's like your vocabulary, like dynamics and everything else. So next question, Janice. Hi, Janice. <laughs> Do you have any kind of physical warm-ups before playing uh, injuries because of, oh, because of no warming up, you mean? Um, yeah, good point. Um, 
I do yoga every day, not much, but like 10 minutes before I play the flute. And it, I think it helps. I mean, I don't do it for that kind of that purpose, but, but I, I like it to, you know, have a um, relaxed body, but I'm sure it helps much better to the flute playing as well. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I do. Um, after practicing, I forget to do stretching, but I think you should all do. <laughs> Maybe I should write that down. Don't forget to stretch afterwards too. So that's that. And then I uh, wanted to ask you, how can we make the audience feel the same emotion as us when we play? I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's why we practice, you know, to, so there are two aspects. One is to make it equal of your playing and your idea, because there's our ideas and interpretation and your playing is not quite there. And that's why we practice to catch up to that point. And then the, the second aspect is to um, make sure what you try to express is delivered correctly to the audience. And I, I really enjoy talking about this, explain about this to like opera singers or ballet dancers on stage. We classical musicians don't do the visual effects much, but when you see actors, um, theater, maybe not, the yeah, theater as well. Yeah, when you see the makeup in clothes, their eyes are half the face and they put shadows on the nose and red lipstick so that, you know, far, far away they can still recognize your eyes, nose, and mouth. And same thing with the music. Somehow we have to do more than what we think it is. So yeah, I would suggest that. Oh my God, I'm behind with so many questions now. Tips for practicing double and triple tonguing. Um, do it slower with metronome like a machine, you know? Don't just put metronome uh, in the real tempo. Like we said before, don't be afraid of going slower and really slow. Nobody's listening. And that's where we build up our strength when nobody's watching, when nobody's re listening. And yeah, that's how it all happens and develops. And we, you know, we, we, we get to only see people in a finished product, but never forget the behind the scene. That's where all the magic is happening. Um, how, how do you control the intonation when play slow movements? Usually I go low when I think. Yeah, when you know you go low, um, don't play low. <laughs> it all starts with the awareness um, and how you listen. And don't forget that every pitch and intonation is subjective. When you play all the correct pitch, what your tuner says, it doesn't always sound correct to the ears because it depends on which harmony you're in and which note in the harmony you're in and which kind of timber you're playing with. If you play with oboist, clarinetist or violinist, depends on the timber, the intonation could sound funky. So um, to train your ears, it's the most important things because you fix what bothers you. It doesn't bother to your ears. You will, you will not fix it. So that's that. Um, thank you. What's your approach to breathing well slash lasting long phrases without feeling empty pretty soon? Um, so in my teen teenage days, when I went to Mr. Kaner's lesson, Jeffrey Kaner's lesson, he told me so many times, why do you have to breathe there? Don't breathe there, no breathing there. And you can go without any breathing. I'm like, um, I don't think I can do that. And then he would, he would show me without any breathing. And I'm like, uh, okay, I'll try that too, you know? And then I try it and it works without breathing. You know, it works with omitting one breath. So he kind of, showed me he kind of showed me um 
it's actually possible. So in other words, first it's in your head and also um, when you, how our body is built, oh my God, I'm, I'm speaking in front of Harvard students about bodies. <laughs> um, correct me if I'm wrong. What I heard is that our body signals to the brain that if we are only left only one third of the air in our lungs, body signals to the brain that, oh, you're out of air and then you, we breathe. But the truth is when we feel like we're out of air, that's when we still have one third of the air left in the lungs. So just push a little bit longer and you'll be surprised. Surprise, surprise. Do you feel that how you move on the stage helps the audience feel the emotions you have in mind? Okay, what's that mean? Do you feel that how you move on? I have the moving helps the audience feel. I have no idea. But what I know for sure is that moving should be part of your musical phrase. You shouldn't just move or just not move. So I'm not against moving or not moving, but if you move, it should serve the phrase and it shouldn't be choreographed. It, I think it happens naturally with your phrase, especially the wind instrument like ours. Um, somehow when we use the air, the phrase goes with it and the body follows. And that's how I feel. Oh, one minute left and five more questions left. Uh, <laughs> Uh, where, where, where was I? Mm, best exercise. The best exercise in one word, mois sonorite. <laughs> that's the best and that's the Bible. Although I might write a, another method. <laughs> um, do you have uh, any advice? High notes softly. Um, high notes loud or soft or doesn't matter. Uh, it should be supported by the air. If you're, if it's well supported, um, it doesn't matter high, no high notes, low notes, you wouldn't even feel it. It's all there. So focus more on how to control your air more masterfully. <laughs> so you should be the master of controlling your own air. Um, the questions are keep coming. Shall I keep going or are you going to close it? Yeah, um, so we are reaching the end of our time. Um, so we might, I think if we want, we could finish off with one more question or we could just end with that last question. It's up to you. Um, let's see, maybe one more question. Tips, advice for music school. Uh, do your best, sorry. <laughs> advice from music school you know um <laughs> it just reminded me uh, that's why i'm laughing uh, that uh, when i interviewed jeffrey kaner the other day i gathered so many questions from the students uh beforehand and i gave him the list of questions it was 10 plus questions and he said you know don't ask me questions when the answer is practice <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I'll finish at that. Um, thank you so much, everybody. And thanks for stopping by. Um, really, it was a pleasure listening to you guys. And even in this difficult time, and it's, I think it's special that we are trying to still do whatever we can in the given situation and to be able to connect everybody from their own home. I'm sitting in Korea in a Sunday morning, oh my God, I haven't been woken up this early in the last 10 days with my jet lag, but it was nice. And um, <laughs> great to hear such an amazing performers. Really, you guys are so inspiring, really. I mean, you guys are asking me many questions, but I have so many questions to you guys. Oh, really amazing how you guys manage all that. So thank you and stay safe and healthy. And see you soon, somewhere, yeah, thank you. somewhere <laughs> soon. <laughs> thank you, Yura. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Joanna, Jenny, Elizabeth. Have a nice day, nice evening, nice afternoon. <laughs>